We are Acts chapter 16, so if you want to take your Bibles and go to Acts chapter 16, that's where we will be studying today. If you didn't bring a Bible, you can always pull up a Bible on your phone. I'm reading from New King James Version. If you're new to Cornerstone, we go straight through the Bible. We are presently going through the book of Acts, and today we're going to land here in chapter 16. In our study through the book of Acts, we have learned about Paul a very zealous Jew who was originally bent on persecuting Christians because he believed that Christianity was a heretical sect and that Jesus was not the Messiah. That is, of course, until the Lord Jesus appeared to him personally. And when Paul had this encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, Paul gets radically saved. He has this radical conversion experience. It doesn't mean that he stops being Jewish. He's Jewish by birth, but he's a Christ follower by faith. He's a Christian by faith. And when he gets saved, he spends 10 years um, in, on the backside of the Arabian desert. Later, he will go to Jerusalem, visit with the disciples. But in those 10 years, God is preparing him for ministry. And then at the end of those 10 years, following his conversion, he then begins what Acts records as three different missionary journeys into parts of Asia Minor and even into Europe, sharing the good news of Jesus with all who will listen to him, spreading this good news about salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. He is a Jew, so he goes first to a Jewish community whenever he visits a city. Uh, for the most part, unfortunately, they reject him. Some believe, most reject and Paul is predominantly sent to reach the Gentile, the non-Jewish uh, Roman world uh, during the first century. So he takes three missionary journeys recorded in the book of Acts. The first missionary journey we already covered, that is detailed between chapters 13 and 14 of Acts. And he comes back to Antioch in Syria where, uh, where he visits with the church that originally sent him on that first missionary journey. And he kind of regroups and he spends about a year before he launches into his second missionary journey. He will take new traveling companions with him. His first journey, he took Barnabas. Barnabas will take his cousin, John Mark, and they will go on their own journey. And Barnabas fades off the pages of the Bible at this point. Paul will take uh, three new traveling companions with him. One of the men is Silas. He's a Jew and a leader at the church in Jerusalem. He will also take Timothy with him. About halfway through his journey, he, he encounters a follower of Christ. Timothy's only about 15 years of age at this particular time. He had a Jewish mother and a Jewish grandmother, but Timothy had a Greek, otherwise a Gentile, father. And Timothy becomes a protege of Paul's. And Paul takes him with him on this missionary journey. And about 15 years later, when Timothy is 30 years of age, roughly, Timothy begins to pastor the church in Ephesus. And Paul will write two letters to him as a young pastor. Those letters are 1st and 2nd Timothy. And then another companion that Paul takes with him is Luke. Now, Luke is a Gentile. Luke is the one writing the book of Acts. And he doesn't specifically mention his name as joining Paul on the second missionary journey, but we know he does because here in chapter 16, verse 10, Luke as the writer changes the pronouns in the narrative. He, he was saying they, them, and then all of a sudden he starts saying we, us. It's the only good time to change the pronouns, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Why do I even have to say that? Isn't this weird now? But anyway, he's writing the narrative and he talks about they, Paul, Silas, and then in verse 10 he starts saying we, and he refers to us because he's joined them in this missionary journey. And they end up in Macedonia, which is modern day Greece. And they come to a prominent city in Greece called Philippi. Now, Philippi is named for and was developed by Philip II of Macedon. He was king of Macedon from 359 to 336 BC. Philip was also the father of Alexander the Great. And he developed Philippi into an important Roman colony that was just as prestigious as Rome itself. You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna invest a lot of time, effort, energy, and money into completely refurbishing a city, you might as well name it after yourself. And that's what he did. 
So Philip named the city Philippi. There was no Jewish presence in this town. We know that because, again, Paul's custom was to go to a synagogue when he visited a city and first minister there. There is no synagogue in Philippi at this time, meaning there are less than 10 Jewish men living in the city of Philippi. And so because there's no synagogue there, Paul goes down to the river with Silas and Timothy and Luke as a place of prayer. You know, if you can't go to church, get out to nature and go visit God in nature. And so that's what, that's what Paul ends up doing. And when he's down there at the river, he encounters a few different women. He starts sharing the gospel with them. One is named Lydia, and she becomes the first convert on European soil. And we read about this and much more here in chapter 16. If you have your Bibles open now, I'm going to start reading at verse 11 down through verse 34. Verse 11 says, Therefore sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, and the inference is because she believed in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that, her, that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. And then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called, up with, uh, but Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Let's pause there and pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your word. We thank you for this story that is so um, amazing in many different ways. And we pray that you would use it today to speak to our own hearts. Here we are. Almost 2,000 years later, we pray, God, that you would use it now to speak afresh to us today. And we love you, Lord, and we thank you that you first loved us and sent Jesus to die on a cross. And we pray, God, you would speak to us today. Use it now in our hearts and lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 
You know, a lot of times I, I come to you with three points or four or more, and um, it's a very structured teaching. And I just want to tell you up front, the Lord has laid a very simple theme on my heart from this story. Um, not several points, one simple point that we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, there are many wonderful takeaways from this story, not the least of which is the way the story ends with the Philippian jailer getting saved and his whole household. I mean, how awesome is that, that you're so moved in the moment that you even actually pursue the question, what must I do to be saved? But the Lord directed me towards a simple theme out of this story that will be the focal point of our study today because I, I want us to focus on this remarkable response that Paul and Silas had to their circumstances by the way that they prayed and sang in prison. Now, you know, the story that we just read details about how they had just been severely beaten by a mob, thrown into prison for what? I mean, the charges are pretty vague. It's just you, you were disturbing the peace. There's really an underlying issue here, which we'll get to as to why they were so angry. And it was really inspired by the owners of the slave girl. But nevertheless, there they are in prison. They've been beaten severely. They don't know whether they're going to live or die. People have been martyred already in the early church before them. So they have no idea whether God is going to miraculously rescue them or whether they're going to go the way of the martyrs before them. And yet, they're praying and they're singing. Now, before we talk about that, let's review how they got there. In the story, it says that after they led Lydia to Christ and her household, they returned to the place of prayer, presumably again down by the river, and they encounter this time a slave girl. She is owned by a couple that is making a lot of money off of her because it tells us that not only is she a slave, she is also demon possessed. There's literally a, an evil spirit that has entered her. We don't know the background, how that evil spirit got in her, but she is possessed by a demon. And it says specifically, she has a spirit of divination. Now, when you look in the Old Testament, basically a spirit of divination was a demonic principality that would interpret events and situations with this kind of clarion, you know, false wisdom. And thus people would seek out this girl for them, for her to tell them their future. That would be a, you know, a fortune telling kind of a thing. And, and a lot of times demons will either deceive you with lies or they will know just enough that they, because they're not all knowing by any means, but they, they might know enough in the spirit realm that they can, you know, lead you and intrigue you in a way that you're drawn to this kind of thing. And, and listen, you know, even this kind of thing unfortunately happens today where there are seances and there are mediums and there are psychics. Some of it, they're just charlatans and they're just, you know, trying to get your money. But others have tapped into the demonic and they, just like in this story, are actually being inspired by satanic principalities and powers to try to speak in, into your life. Please don't consult them. If you have in the past, just, you know, renounce that and ask for forgiveness. That is not of God. In fact, God condemns that kind of thing in his word, Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 12. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire or one who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer or one who conjures spells or a medium or a spiritist or one who calls up the dead for all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And so this girl is possessed by this kind of a spirit making a lot of money uh, for her owners. The demon is exploiting her. The owners are exploiting her for a fortune She's not Jewish, so she doesn't know the law that I just read. Neither is she a Christian, at least not yet. So she, she doesn't have any, um, any standard by, by which to know right from wrong. And she's just doing what the demon inspires her to do anyway. So she's an unfortunate victim of the whole thing, both of the demon and of the owners. 
And it tells us here in Acts 16, if you notice again, verses 17 and 18, it says, the girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And verse 18 says, and she did this for many days. Now I have a couple of questions when I read that. The first question is, why did Paul allow this to go on for many days? And number two, the question I have is, it seemed like she was actually making a true statement, which seems like qu quite a contradiction. You got somebody possessed by a demon who is saying something that's true. These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. So in there, there's a real irony and contradiction in all of that. And so in, in trying to answer my own questions, here's, here's the first answer that I, I, I have to assume. You know, why did Paul allow this to go on for many days? Probably for the reason that you allow somebody annoying around you to go on for many days, <laughs> hoping that it'll play out and the person will just go away. <laughs> You know, maybe they'll get transferred to another, you know, job and, you know, so I don't have to see them every day in the cubicle or whatever it might be. You just are hoping it'll play out. You don't want to have to, like, address every annoyance in your life. Hopefully some of these things will just play out and go away. I think he's just trying to give it time to see how it goes away, if it will go away. But instead it says that he was annoyed. Yeah, verse 18 says, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. The demon left her. And so Paul was used by God to deliver her from this demonic possession. Um, he became annoyed. And what was wrong with what was going on here? Because it's wrong on a few different levels. First, first, the girl had bad theology. Now, if you read some Bible commentaries, they say that the Greek word, the article the, for the way of salvation, when she says, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation, that the article the can also be translated a, a way of salvation. And that in fact, if she was going around saying, these men are, are you know, men of the Most High God who are proclaiming the way, a way of salvation, to us, then it's implying that there are other ways to be saved. Well, Paul can't allow that to be going on and on for many days. So that's a possibility. It's also bad theology because you have to remember, this is the Greco-Roman first century. So some say that when she was going around saying, these men are servants of the most high God to the ears of those influenced by the Greco-Roman culture, they're thinking these are representatives of Zeus. So Paul has to direct her theology. That's one reason why he had to shut her down. But in addition, she's just a bad distraction. She's a bad distraction. I don't care if she is saying something that is noble or, or possibly even accurate and good. You have someone following you around day after day after day, just saying something that is good constantly, that's annoying, that's a distraction. Can you imagine if somebody stood outside a Hobby Lobby? Let's try to pick at least one decent company that's still around. Somebody, somebody is standing outside a Hobby Lobby saying, this is the best store ever. Everybody ought to shop here. This is the best store ever. Everybody ought to shop here. And they're just doing that day after day after day. I guarantee you a store manager is going to come out at some point and say, thank you very much. You're a distraction. You're scaring the customers. Please leave. <laughs> Even if they're saying something good. She's serving here as a bit of a distraction. And the third reason that he had to shut her up and deliver the demon out of her is because, frankly, she's bad advertising. She's bad advertising. She's possessed by a demon, okay? These guys, Paul and Silas, are going around trying to proclaim the news of the gospel, and you got this demon girl following them around trying to advertise for what they're doing. But they're on opposite teams, so it's not really good advertisement. You got a demon-possessed girl who's advocating for the gospel? This doesn't make sense. And that would be like Hunter Biden being a spokesman for TurboTax. Do you know what I'm saying to you? That just... Sorry. I... That's 200 jokes in a month, ladies and gentlemen. I... Just pray for me. But anyway, that's, that's the idea. Like, well, that doesn't seem to fit. That's kind of a contradiction there. Of course, that's bad advertising. So Paul's like, you know what, demon, you need to come out in the name of Jesus Christ. And she gets delivered. 
Now, on any ordinary day, that would be a reason to celebrate. This girl, possessed by a demon, has been delivered, delivered from this demon. But on this day, it's not a good day. And the reason it's not a good day, it was for her, but not for her owners, because now their fortune is going down the drain. Because when the demon went out, so did her ability to do any fortune telling for people. And therefore, business dried up, and immediately her owners are mad. And they're mad at Paul and Silas, because you guys are the ones who delivered her, and now my business is down the tank. So it says that the owners, you know, rush to Paul and Barnabas, drag them to the magistrates. By the way, it doesn't make any reference. I think like Luke and, and Timothy must have ducked into a Dairy Queen, because all of a sudden they're not even in the story. They're like, well, this is going down. Let's go get an ice cream cone. And so they're, they're like gone. But in reality, you know what probably happened to them? It tells us here that when the mob accused them before the magistrates, they refer to their Jewish heritage of Paul and Silas. Remember, Luke was a Gentile, and Timothy had a Greek father. And so Timothy probably looked Greek, probably looked more Gentile. They went after the two Jewish guys. This is anti-Semitism at its core. And they bring Paul and Silas before the magistrates. They're all angry. Again, the charges are basically disturbing the peace. We don't like these guys. What do you say? The magistrates rip off their clothing, beat them, and then imprison them. And not just in any prison, the inner, the inner prison chained, their feet fastened in the stocks, verse 24 tells us. So this is like you're chained inside maximum security, which, by the way, makes for an even better miracle when God breaks them out of jail. Amen? But here they are, thrown into prison. And by the way, by the way, this is against Roman law. You, you can't accuse, condemn, beat, and imprison Roman citizens. But they didn't know that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. But it tells us later in verse 37 that they were Roman citizens. And so they had uh, broken, the Romans had broken their own law to do what they did to Paul and Silas. And amazingly, amazingly, while they are waiting for their miracle in prison, or for all they know, waiting to be executed, because they don't know, they don't know which way this is gonna go, they do the only thing they can do. They pray and they sing. And the other prisoners hear them praying and singing. You know, I hope it never comes down to any of us losing our physical freedom because of our faith. But if it comes down to that, they might be able to physically imprison you, but they can never take away your relationship with the Lord. These guys were physically incarcerated, but spiritually they were free and they were praying to God and they were singing to God. And I have to be honest with you, and this brings us to this simple theme that I alluded to at the beginning of our study. I got stuck at this point in my prep for today's teaching. I got stuck here because I felt challenged by the Lord about the depth of these guys' relationship with Jesus, that they would be praying and singing. Now, this might not sound very spiritually mature for me, but just being honest with you, I don't know, trying to put myself in their shoes for the moment, I don't know that if I were attacked by a mob beaten mercilessly, thrown into prison in a foreign country, because that's where they are, they're in Greece, it's foreign to them, at a time when Christians are being killed for their faith, I don't know that if I endured the same situation, would I be able to sing? The praying part I get, you know, nothing like a crisis to develop your prayer life. Do you know what I'm saying to you? I, I'm sure I'd be praying. It was the singing part. 
And I've read this story countless times. But for the first time as I read it, I was so challenged by their relationship with the Lord at such a level where they were not only praying, anybody can pray in a crisis, but they were singing. I'd like to think that I'd be praying and singing, but it's easy to think the best of yourself until you're actually in the situation. I think rather probably what I'd be doing is scribbling a goodbye note to Terry with a rock on the wall of the cell. I think I'd be reliving the memories of my family. I think I'd wonder if this is going to be the end. And I think my mind would go to a dark place and I'd be praying, but I don't know about the singing part. And as I put myself in this story, I wondered would I have instinctively reacted like Paul and Silas did in the same situation? And so I, I actually turned it into a prayer. And here's my simple prayer that maybe you would want to join me in praying. And it's, it's just this, Lord, teach me to sing in the darkness. Teach me to sing in the darkness. Now, for Paul and Silas, it's both literally and figuratively a dark place because verse 25 says it was midnight. They're thrown in prison at midnight. They're in the inner cell, so I'm sure they can't even see their hand in front of their faces. It's that dark, literally, but they're in a very dark place spiritually, emotionally, mentally, not knowing if they will be miraculously delivered. Remember in Acts chapter 12, Peter was thrown into prison and he was miraculously delivered and that also by an earthquake. But also in Acts chapter 12, another apostle, James, was beheaded. He was not miraculously delivered, at least not in an earthly sense. He was miraculously delivered to his eternal reward. But we talked about that when we were in Acts chapter 12. How is it in the same chapter, two apostles, two followers of Christ who both loved Jesus, one was rescued and one was martyred? And Paul and Silas, for all they know, they don't know if this is going to turn out the way of Peter or this is going to turn out the way of James. And nevertheless, they're, they're sitting there in chains and they're praying and they are singing. And I don't know about you, but... My resolve when I read this story is good times or bad times, Lord, teach me to sing in the darkness. I don't want to only sing when things are good. I want to sing when things are falling apart too. Because no matter what my circumstance, it doesn't change the character and nature of God and he is worthy of our praise in good times or bad times. Lord, teach me to sing in the darkness. When the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem in 586 BC, they ravaged the place, they destroyed the place. And Habakkuk the prophet wrote about those days, he said in Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18, he said, though the fig tree may not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, Though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He's saying, well, everything else is destroyed and life is falling apart and we're being invaded by this foreign army. This is a dark time. He says, yet I will sing in the darkness. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Many of you have probably heard the story of Horatio Spafford and the song that he wrote, It Is Well With My Soul. I've told this story many times here at Cornerstone, but you may not have heard the rest of their story. There's a part two after their tragedy. Now, for the sake of those who have never heard the first part, just a quick synopsis. Horatio Spafford was a very successful attorney in the 1800s living in Chicago, very prosperous, very successful, had a lot of money invested in real estate that got completely destroyed when the great Chicago fire swept through the city in 1871. He lost everything. And when he lost everything, uh, shortly after the great Chicago fire, a couple years later in 1873, he sent his wife and four little girls on a ship over to Paris to have some time to just kind of 
relax and, and, and refresh their weary souls after they lost everything there in Chicago. And so Anna and her four children, Anna Spafford and her four children, got on board that sailing vessel. And on November the 21st, 1873, there was a mid-Atlantic collision with another sailing vessel. Anna Spafford's, the vessel she was on with her four daughters sank within 20 minutes. And all four of their daughters drowned. Annie was 11, Maggie 9, Bessie was 5, Tanetta was 2. Anna Spafford herself was knocked unconscious. She was rescued on some floating debris. And after she was rescued, Anna then later telegrammed her husband with the words, saved alone. So shortly thereafter, Horatio boarded another ship and he asked the captain, when you get out to the place where roughly the area where my daughters perished, would you stop the boat? And so the captain did, and that's when Horatio Spafford went back to the cabin on the ship that he was sailing and wrote down the words to the famous hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And out of this man's grief, he sang in the darkness. And he wrote, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That's not some just fake Christianese that is, that is written and sung out of a man's heart who is desperate over the loss of his four daughters. But see, he was able to sing in the darkness because he knew the Lord in a deep way. Well, there's part two to their story. Horatio and Anna Spafford returned home to Chicago after the mid-Atlantic tragedy. They started their lives over. They had a second family, first a son, then a daughter, then another daughter. But sorrow was no stranger to their home. A scarlet fever epidemic claimed their only son at just four years of age. So in 1881, the Spafford said, we gotta start a new life. We're going to leave Chicago. They, along with 16 other people from their church, moved to Jerusalem. They moved to Jerusalem. They started a new life, doing charitable work, pouring themselves out to Jews and Arabs alike. They were known as the American colony. This is a picture from around the late 1800s. There in Jerusalem, they relocated and they were known by the locals as the American colony. This home that they bought ended up becoming later a hotel that is still in operation today, and it is named after them the American Colony Hotel. I want you to notice, we go backwards, the fountain that they're sitting in there. You, you can see it in the picture, the center, the lower section there. It's a beautiful hotel now, it's just a small hotel, with just a few rooms. Terry and I actually went there for the first time last March at the end of the tour of our last group. We had lunch there in the home. That's when I learned about this place. I didn't even know the history of this place. That was because Horatio and Anna Spafford started this place to do charitable work to Arabs and Jews alike. And then they started an orphanage the Spaffords started an orphanage in Jerusalem, which later became a hospital for children, turning their tragedy into a blessing for other children because they knew how to sing in the darkness. It's a children's home that is still operational today near the Damascus Gate. It's called the Spafford Children's Center. Still in operation in the old city of Jerusalem, and several of Horatio and Anna Spafford's great-grandchildren still serve on the board of trustees. Lord, teach me to sing in the darkness. An amazing testimony of people who turned their tragedy into a blessing for many other people because they knew how to, not only in the good times, but in the darkest of times, sing praises to the only true and living God. I close with two passages, Hebrews 13, 15. Let us continually, not when it's convenient, continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. And sometimes it is just that, a sacrifice. It will not come easily. 
That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. And David would write in Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. And I pray, Lord, teach me to sing in the darkness. Would you pray that with me? Lord, as we think about Paul and Silas being imprisoned, not knowing if they would be rescued or killed, they still had it within their hearts to pray and to sing. And the other prisoners heard and how inspiring it must have been for them who could hear them singing in the darkness. And Lord, our prayer is, I know my prayer is, good times or bad, Lord, may there always be a song on my lips because you are worthy of our praise, no matter what the circumstance. It's easy to sing when things are good. So Lord, my prayer is teach me to sing in the darkness when things are not so good, when things are difficult and troubling, teach me to sing in the darkness. And Lord, may it be an encouragement and a ministry to other prisoners who hear. Lord, do your work in our hearts where we are so grateful to you, even when things are falling apart, because we trust you. We believe you are good no matter what is happening around us. And one day we will enjoy our eternal reward. And until that day, Lord, help us to sing not only in the good times, but also in the darkness. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.